Hello and welcome to Live Notes, an introduction to Imperial College's lunchtime concert series run by the Blythe Centre for Music and the Visual Arts. My name is Charlotte DeMille and I'm Associate Lecturer and Curator of Music at the Courtauld Institute. And today I am going to introduce Esther and Daniel Kingsmith's recital, a programme of works for violin and piano inspired by folk song. Folk song collecting and arranging was a common practice in the 19th century, part of a wider interest in folk revival across the arts in response to what they perceived as a homogenization of culture in the wake of industrialization. Like artists keen to preserve traditional crafts, composers and cultural historians were keen to record indigenous folk music, often handed down through an oral practice before it was lost. The composers of this programme were all avid folk collectors who used the richness of folk traditions to reinvigorate their writing. Improvisation was of course endemic to folk traditions. In these arrangements, we could almost sometimes consider them improvisations themselves, where tradition is transported into music that recognises its roots, but is itself progressive. Now, because of my background as an art historian at the Courtauld Institute, I'm going to share some slides with you uh, to contextualise these composers. Our first composer, Manuel de Faya, had spent seven years in Paris before World War I, a friend of Paul Ducard, Maurice Ravel and Claude Debussy. And there's Salvador Dali's portrait of him on the right hand side here on the screen. On the left is Picasso's curtain for a ballet commissioned by Diaghilev and the Ballet Russe um, with music by Fire. The ballet was the three-cornered hat. It was choreographed by Messine and its first performances were at the Alhambra in London in 1919. The ballet adopts Andalusian folk songs and tells the story of a miller's victory over the local magistrate. Fire's Suite Populaire Espanol, which is what you will hear in today's recital, is closely related to his seven Spanish folk songs of 1922, evoking the rhythms and the Phrygian mode of flamenco. In these works, Fire's harmonisations synthesise the French influences he picked up during his time in Paris with the purely indigenous, where the movements Yota and Cancheon anticipate the work of French and Ottitan colleague Joseph Cantaloupe, Nana, another of the uh, the, the settings is a Moorish lullaby. The examples are worthy reminders of the way in which folk traditions often ignore the geographical boundaries of nations. In this case, the Occitan culture stretched from Spanish Catalonia, Catalonia, southern France and Monaco to the Occitan valleys of Italy. It is worth adding too that whilst there are common themes across folk music, often a rural idyll of innocent shepherds and meadows. Equally, the music was often prized by 19th century metropolitan people for their supposed qualities of authenticity, hard work and regionalism. This could be a very provocative mix for those who might wish to find a nationalistic cause or nationalistic agendas. It was all too easy for nation states to appropriate folk music to their causes as happened with Cantaloupe in Vichy France, and with our next composer, Karol Szymanowski, who fought against this appropriation of his music in the newly independent Poland. Szymanowski, uh, there's a portrait here of him on the left and the Tatra Mountains behind. Szymanowski's Polnisch Volkweiser, transcribed here by Paul Koczanski for violin in 1931, comes from Szymanowski's set of Karpian songs, inspired by the Karpi region in northeast Poland. In his preface to the publication of these songs, Szymanowski wrote that the melodies and texts of this arrangement have been taken from the Reverend Władysław Skierokowski's work, The Karpian Forest in Spring, a work that the Reverend began in 1913. You will hear the Karpi region's sound world has distinct modal pentatonic scales with a preference for five beats in a bar. 
The song subjects, which are transcribed here for violin, include the white swan, in the snow, and in the dark forest. Szymanowski, like his European contemporaries, aimed to combine the innovations and discoveries from his international travels to France, Germany and Italy and further afield to invigorate what he felt was the overly folksy parochialism of Polish music. In the context of the recent independence of Poland in 1920, this was quite contentious. Szymanowski said he wished to place his music in a European context, which included Polishness, but that he was against what he regarded as superficial showiness that could too easily be appropriated by nationalistic agendas. In 1904, Szymanowski made his first visit to another folk region of Poland, the Tatra Mountains, around Zakopane. There, he met the avant-garde painter Stanislaw Ignacy Fikatsi, to whom he dedicated his first piano sonata in C minor Op. 8, and it's Fikatsi's portrait that you can see on the screen now. It was with Fritkazzi that Szymanowski travelled to Italy in 1905. Much later, Fritkazzi produced this portrait on the screen, along with two others, and I'm showing you one of those here. The friends shared a deep love and fascination for the folk cultures they encountered in Zakopane. And you can see that in Fritkazzi's dances here on the left, and I'm showing it alongside some traditional masks which are on display in the museum at Zakopane. Fikatsi's dances are almost contemporaneous with the Kupi songs and this is I think quite relevant to the way in which Szymanowski and his friend Fikatsi um, appropriated folk idioms but remade them to, traditional, to, to modern and more progressive contexts. Szymanowski became a long-time resident in Zakopane um, here is his villa in Zakopane, Atma, um, and I'm showing you a photograph of the interior on the right hand side. His house is now a museum, and I thought you might want to see his desk, which is here on the left hand side. The second half of the programme comprises pieces inspired by the rich folk traditions of the British Isles. The prevalence of folk-inspired music from the turn of the last century led composer Elizabeth Lutyens to describe it scathingly as the Calpat school of English pastoral music. The cultivation of an indigenous musical style in Britain was inherently problematic, as since the Tudor composers, there had been relatively few indigenous or native composers who had created a distinctive sound. This was something that Rafe Vaughan Williams had given a lot of thought to with the encouragement of his friend and the fellow folk song collector Cecil Sharp. In the six studies in English folk song, you will hear that the music is infused with an Englishness that was often sought, comparatively or analogously, in Bloomsbury painting. Vaughan Williams' cellist wife, Adeline, was a cousin of the Stephen sisters, Acker, Vanessa Bell and Virginia Woolf. Here, the music has a sense of the sunny floodlit landscapes and domesticity of Charleston Farmhouse, the Bloomsbury Group's home from 1916. And you have the pond at Charleston painted by Vanessa on the screen on the left, and a photograph of Rafe Vaughan Williams and his wife Adeline on the right. In the context of these powerful professional women, and particularly Virginia Woolf's hard won room of one's own, the composer Rebecca Clark must stand as exemplary at a time when women's place was predominantly the domestic arena of the home. Studying composition under Stanford at the Royal College of Music, she graduated in 1910, but it was still an uphill struggle for women professional composers at this time. I'd like to remind you of an anonymous reviewer from 1887 in the Musical Times who claimed that no woman composer has been a great composer, and this is an accepted fact. Clark's Chinese Puzzle, composed in 1921 for solo violin and piano, is an intricate study for the violin. Using the pentatonic scale, by now quite familiar to you, I hope, Clark based her short study on typical oriental themes and harmony rather than indigenous folk. Note both the violin's pizzicato and the piano staccato. Finally, in the tradition of transcribing folk songs, 
and in turn further removals from the original source in transcription to other instruments, I would like to end with a word on Percy Granger's Molly on the Shore from 1907, which you will hear in an arrangement by Fritz Kreisler for violin and piano. Granger was thoroughly unimpressed, saying that it was a thousand times worse than I had foreweaned, and I had not foreweaned anything good. I'll let you contemplate Granger's analysis for yourselves. Enough here to say that the piece is an arrangement of two contrasting Irish reels, Temple Hill and Molly on the Shore. Granger wrote, In setting Molly on the Shore, I strove to imbue the accompanying parts that made up the harmonic texture with a melodic character not too unlike that of the underlying real theme. Melody seems to me to provide music with initiative, whereas rhythm appears to me to exert an enslaving influence. For that reason, I have tried to avoid regular rhythmic domination in my music, always accepting irregular rhythms, such as those of Gregorian chant, which seem to me to make for freedom. Equally, with melody, I prize discordant harmony, because the emotional and compassionate sway it exerts. I hope you enjoy the performance. Do tune in for the Blythe Centre's other lunchtime concerts.